High energy place, are you gonna maximize or are you gonna under deliver? Which one? <laughs> is energy a habit? Yes. yes. I wanna make sure we maximize that habit. So maybe, since the energy's been lower, we should try something. Every one of you in this room is a person of influence. Some of you don't look at it that way, some of you do. Some of you, it's your identity, you're a leader. But how many consider yourself to be a leader of something? <laughs> Let me see your hands. Awesome. What does a leader do? What makes you a leader? What's your job? No, not motivate. You got great people, you need to motivate them. I'm not here to motivate you. You don't need motivation. A leader gets results. And how do they do it? They maximize resources. And the greatest leaders in the world have always found a way to maximize better than anyone else. And in order to maximize resources, one of those steps is intelligence. One of that is hunger. See, Mark is about as hungry today as when I got to know him 17 years ago. We've known each other 27 years. But 17 years ago, we really started working together, personally. And if I look at Richard Branson, he's as hungry today as when he was 16 years old, working in a crypt, coming up with this idea called Virgin. Hunger is incredible. Energy is incredible. But we also have to ask the question, what makes people fail? Who here in this room has ever failed to achieve what you really want in life? A goal, a dream, a desire. Raise your hand, say I. I. Again, if you don't raise your hand, you lie out of the shit too, don't you? Come on. <laughs> We've all failed. So when you failed, tell me why you failed. No one wants to talk about failure, do they? Everybody loves talking about success. But let's be honest. When you fail to achieve your goal, why? Or if it wasn't you, how many of had other people fail you? Let me see your hands. Say I. So now we got all the victims. Perfect. <laughs> so here's my question. When you failed to achieve your goal, why did you fail? Tell me. What's that? You quit too soon. Very nice. That's an honest answer. Give a hand. That's great. Give a hand for that, please. Come on. Someone else, why'd you fail? Didn't take action, got distracted. Fear. Come on, what else? Didn't have the right people. People said didn't have the right leader, sir. <laughs> right? Come on, what else? Didn't have the money, didn't have the capital. Didn't have the technology. Didn't have the contacts. What's that? Making excuses, which all this is. Isn't it? By the way, I've done this. Who's done this? Who's made excuses like this to yourself? Let me show your hands. The first time I ever asked this question was when I spoke at TED way many, many moons ago. It was when it was really tiny here in Northern California. And they got up and told me, you have 18 minutes. In my shortest seminar, by the way, the reason I'm somewhat stressed, I want to add so much value to you today. And I got less than three hours. And I walk in the room and your energy's low. I'm like, I really want to serve you. I didn't come here to do a freaking speech. I don't do that. I came here because I love this man. I came here because this community is going to create 1.9 million jobs in the next four years. Pretty amazing. We're living in a time that's crazy, isn't it? Living in a time where we are, in America, we're the economy everybody looks at. Our feeble economy is what people are looking at and wanting. That's how bad it is in the world. We're living in a time where people don't know what to think next where the economy around the world has been inflated, not with dollars or money, we don't even print it anymore, we couldn't afford to. We put ones and zeros in computers. We're living in a time for the first time in 5,000 years of banking, where a banker now says to you in most parts of the world, here's what I'll do, give me your money, and I'll charge you and take your money. <laughs> Negative interest rates. Uh, how do you explain that? Who's dumb enough to do that? Toyota is offering you bonds right now. Do you know what they're offering for their bonds? 0 0.001. It'll take you 69,000 years to double your money one time. That's the world we're in today. We're in a place of such uncertainty, and I'm here because there are tools that Mark and I have used over the years 
and all the people I know that change their lives and their businesses. I'm also here because this is a community that I know is socially conscious because I know what the values are of this man and they're mine as well. I'll give you an example. When I look at how to create answers, I don't look for the excuses. I look for what can be done. And what I found is this, when I first did this at TED years ago, I asked this question because I walked in, one of the only times it was about as quiet as this room. And I asked people, and you know, the room in those days was very small. It was the heads of Google, the guys from Yahoo, Steve Jobs was in the room, pretty great group. In fact, it was the day that they came out with a technology that made this happen. They showed it for the first time from MIT. They pinched things and pictures grew. You can move things with your fingers. And we were so blown away. And Microsoft went in and bought the entire thing that was demonstrated. It was a tabletop with pictures. And Steve Jobs quietly walked back and went, I'm going to use that for a phone and change the world. Right? So here's what I said that day. I asked this question. I said, how many of you have ever failed? Not one hand went up. I said, I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. And I said, how many of you failed? And now everybody raised their hand. And I said, when you failed, why'd you fail? And I heard some of the same things I heard here. What were the things people said? Didn't have enough time. Didn't have enough capital. Didn't have the right technology. Didn't have the right contacts. Right? Didn't have the right people. Didn't have all these things. And in the voice in the darkness, because it's a very dark room, I heard this voice say, didn't have enough Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and I looked out, it was Al Gore. Vice President Al Gore there. And, and everybody started clapping, right, like crazy. And I looked at him and I said, that's one way to explain why you didn't become President of the United States. But I said, it's not an accurate one. I said, of course, easy for me to say, I never ran for president. But let's see if what you guys, if I'm true or not. When you told me all the reasons why you failed, you told me resources you were lacking. Courage is a resource, right? Time is a resource. Money is a resource. People are a resource. Technology is a resource. But here's the challenge. Resources are never the real problem. We all know it if we look around. Think about it. You can get the resources if you're resourceful enough. Resources are not the challenge, it's resourcefulness. So what is it we're really missing? It's some form of human emotion that we have learned to value less and less in a technologically driven society. See, if you're creative enough, can you get the answer, yes or no? Yes or no? And creativity is a resource. If you're committed enough, can you get the capital, yes or no? If you care deeply enough for other people, will you get people to help you, yes or no? Yes. Are the answers there if you're resourceful enough, yes or no? Yes. And in fact, whenever you see people in business that fail, they'll always tell you they were missing resources when they really just weren't resourceful enough. This man is incredibly resourceful. I'm resourceful. Every person that I work with who's gone from nothing to a billionaire, and I've interviewed 50 of them just in the last four years to give you an idea, which is why I gave you that book. I'm not going to talk about that. I just want to give you a gift because I literally spent four years of my life interviewing these people. And they, none of the people I interviewed were from the Lucky Sperm Club. They all built it from scratch. <laughs> they did it by doing one simple thing you got to do in business, which is finding a way to do more for others than who? Than you, yourself, but more than anyone else in the industry. You got to find a way to add more what? And when I did these interviews, one of the things that came across when I was doing this is these people just took no excuses. They knew they could get the resources if they were resourceful enough. So what are the ultimate resources? Creativity, joy, love, determination, flexibility. With those things, there's nothing we can't get. Who agrees with me on this? Say I. I. And then I turned back to Vice President Al Gore and I said, you know, so I heard you say you didn't have enough Supreme Court justices, but last night I watched you give a speech and he gave his inconvenient truth speech for the first time and he was so passionate. Al Gore was passionate. It was an amazing thing. <laughs> I'd never seen it before and I said to him, I've never seen you that passionate ever before. I said, I watched the debate between you and George W. Bush and I wanted to vote for you, but I couldn't. You just didn't have the energy, you kind of had an attitude. I said, you were not resourceful. I said, it never should have come down to justice as having to make that decision. It's because you were not resourceful enough. And there's this pause in the room, and all of a sudden everybody stood up in Democratic Northern California and started clapping like crazy. And Al stood up and came by and gave me a little high five, a little hug. 
And afterwards they said, get him run for president again. I said, no, no, no. But the point is it's resources. And if you're resourceful enough, you can do it. So when I was writing this book, I decided to get a little resourceful myself. And I thought, gosh, I, have, I grew up dirt poor, no money for food. And somebody fed my family when I was 11 years old. And they came to the door literally on Thanksgiving and knock on the door and here is this tall guy standing there with bags of food in a, in a pan on the floor on the ground with an uncooked turkey. And I'll never forget, he said, is your father home? And I said, just one moment. And I ran to get my dad thinking he'd be so excited. And unfortunately he was not. He was annoyed even though we didn't have any food. And the man said, sir, this is a gift from you. Someone knows you're having a tough time. They want you to have a beautiful Thanksgiving. And my father said, we don't take charity. And he went to slam the door in the man's face. And the man kind of had his foot here and it bounced off his foot. And he's holding the bag still. And he said, sir, he said, this is not a handout. Everyone has tough times. This is a gift. The person's doing it anonymously. They just want you to have a great Thanksgiving. And my dad said, we don't take charity. He started to slam the door again. This time he put his shoulder into it and he hit and bounced off of him. He, and then he said something to my father. I thought my father was going to punch him. He said to my father, don't let your family point straight at me. Don't let them suffer because of your ego. Oh, I thought there was going to be a fight. My dad gave him a scowl, took the groceries, threw them on the table, slammed the door, never said thank you. And that day impacted me. It's why I'm here right now. Because that day I had to figure out a question in my mind, which is how could my father be so angry about someone helping? And how come I was so happy? And the reason is right now as you're listening to me, in every moment of your life, you're making three decisions. You might want to jot them down and see if it's true right now. The first decision you're making is what are you going to focus on? Because whatever we focus on, we feel. And most of us let the world control our focus. You know, people say we're in the information age. We're not in the information age. The information age died a long time ago. We're drowning in information. We're starving for wisdom, aren't we? And so the bottom line is, you look around and I see my father, and what did he focus on? He focused on the fact that he had not provided food for his family. How would that make you feel if you knew you had failed at that level? You can get he was beating himself up. I focused on the fact there was food. What a concept. I was so excited. He focused on he had not provided it. The second question we ask every moment in our life is what does this mean? Is this the end or the beginning? Is this person dissing you? Is this person attacking you? Is this person challenging you? Is this person loving you? Is this person coaching you? Whichever meaning you make is going to determine your emotion. Am I here to pump you up and motivate you? Am I here to serve you? Am I here to offer you some pieces you can make some decisions from that could be life-changing if you want them to? You get to decide. But whatever you decide is going to be your experience today and every day of your life. And most of us don't make these decisions consciously. We've got a conditioned response based on our past. So for most of us, the future is pretty much going to be like our past. We might make more money. We might do better in business. But we run into the same problems over and over again. How many can relate in some way inside here? Raise your hand if you can. Say, I. My dad said the question, what does this mean? I know what it meant to him because he said it out loud over and over again to all of us. I knew he focused didn't have the food, but he didn't provide it because he said, I failed my family. I am a failure. There's no food for my family that couldn't be a bigger failure. And the bottom line is out of that experience, he made the third decision, what I'm going to do. And what he decided to do was leave our family shortly thereafter, which at the time was the most painful experience I thought of my life. But it turned out, you know, your worst experience of life can become your best if you decide to use it. And for me, I said, my God, there's food. But the big thing that changed my life was the meaning. And the meaning was strangers care. That's the meaning I pulled out of it. My father always said, no one gives a damn about anybody else. And I had plenty of evidence in the way we lived our life and the people around us. You know, there wasn't anybody coming to help before that ever. And we were always in a challenged place. When I started believing strangers care, it changed my whole life. One belief can change your life. Today, you can make one decision in the next little time we're together and literally change your life without hyperbole, without BS, without exaggeration, not positive thinking, because our beliefs create and our beliefs destroy our life. And we have to become conscious as which ones are empowering us, we use them more, which ones are pulling. And most of us are going so fast, responding to our world, that we don't actually stop and really check in and feel what's really going on. 
So my third one is, what am I going to do? I decided someday I'm going to give back. I'm going to do this for other people because this changed my life. And so I have. I started when I was 17. I decided to feed two families. And it was, I didn't have any money, but I was like committed. I went to the grocery store and I got two baskets. And I thought, I'm going to feed two families for like three days. I'm going to make this incredible Thanksgiving for them. I know what it meant to me. It's going to mean that to them. And I went to the store manager since I had much money and I said, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to feed two families. Help me out. Give me a discount. And they gave me 10% off. And I thought, cheap bastard. <laughs> but I took the 10%. <laughs> and it was the best shopping spree I'd ever gone on in my life. And I'll never forget, I called a local church I was connected to and I said, who do you know that needs help but won't ask for it? Because that was us. And they gave me the names of two families. And I'll never forget, I went to the first family and it, it's, it shaped everything in my life. Because I borrowed an old van from a friend of mine. I didn't know how to drive a stick shift, so that was a very interesting drive. And I went took the groceries, and I pulled up to the first house, and I wrote a note, and I'd done it before I got there, and I said, this is just a gift from a friend. Have a beautiful Thanksgiving, and just know that you're deeply loved. Everyone has tough times. And if you can, someday do well enough to do this for one other family and pay it forward. I put love a friend. I didn't see who I was. And they had someone else write it in Spanish in the back, just in case they didn't speak English, which was really helpful, because when I got there, they didn't speak English. And this woman about this tall <laughs> opens the door, and she sees me holding these two things. I wore t-shirts and jeans, because I wasn't going to be the giver, because I remember that insulted my dad. So I just made sure that it was just like, I'm the delivery boy. And this woman screamed, and she grabbed my neck and she pulled me down and started kissing the side of my face. And I was like, no, no, delivery man, delivery man. She goes, no, 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 no. And she, I couldn't understand. And then she finally says, gift, gift God, gift God. Gift from God. And so I started getting a little teared. I was like, no, delivery guy. And, and so I kind of motioned where I put these groceries and I'll never forget. She motioned me in and as she did, she had four children and one hit one leg, one hit the other. <laughs> They were starving for love and attention, and they were really starving for food, too. And when they saw this, they were so excited, and it just lifted my soul. And so much so, that then they followed me back out to get to the truck, to the van, and I got some more bags. When they saw the pumpkin pie, it was over. <laughs> and the moment that has seared into my memory of my life, that changed my life, was seeing at the end, I, I didn't want to leave, but I had to, I go to the other food, and then one little boy just would not let go of my leg, looking up to me, and. It was just one of those surreal moments in your life because I was that boy one day, not that long ago. And so I walked in there and I tried to give him a hug and finally tried to excuse myself. And I don't speak any Spanish. I felt embarrassed. I should have. But uh, I turned the woman and she's crying like this and smiling and crying. Quite a mixture of emotion. And I'm feeling myself trying not to cry. And then, you know, all of a sudden I try to say, Happy Thanksgiving, and I know, so I said, Feliz Navidad. <laughs> I knew those two words, right? And I got in the van, I'll never forget, I put the thing in reverse, backed up, I looked up in the rearview mirror, and I saw her face with the four kids there, and uh, I left out one little detail that I found out. Her husband had left her a week before with kids with no money and no food. I had no clue. You want to talk about guidance, God, fate, whatever you want to call it. But it was there. Grace is what I would call it. And I remember I just started bawling uncontrollably. And I thought, why am I crying? It's such a beautiful moment. And I realized in that moment, the worst day of my life was the best day of my life. Because what I have ever been there if my father had been the man I wanted him to be in my life. If he had stayed, if he had done the things that I would want him to do, I wouldn't have the drive. And so I fed two families that time, that Thanksgiving. And then I went from there to four, and then to eight, and then I got a little small company I started, and they all got involved, and then I got to 100,000 people, and then I got to a million, then two million, and about, I don't know, about 12 years ago, I fed two million people through my foundation, and then I matched it. I've been matching every year since then, four million people a year to be fed, to give you an idea. And then, when I read this, when I was writing this book, I got really resourced. I thought, these guys are multi-billionaires. I'm moving in that direction, which is an incredible privilege. And I'm doing this good work, but i got to step up my game. Because while we're watching these guys make billions, we're also in a world where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And it isn't right. 
And we all have something we can do about it. And people like you are the ones that will do that. If we succeed, we have more we can give. If that becomes our, our ethic, our way of being. And so the bottom line is I thought, you know what? How many people have I fed in my lifetime? And at that point, I'd fed 42 million people in the course of my life. And I thought, what if I did that in one year? And I got resourceful. And I found out how to do 50 million people. And then I got more inspired and I fed 100 million people last year. So the real reason I'm here is the other reason is I'd like to call to you to do so well that you can do well for others. And if you won't give a dime out of a dollar, I can promise you won't give a hundred million out of a billion. This guy did it when he had nothing. I've done it when I had nothing. That's why I'm doing it now, doing well, that's really wonderful. And I was here in San Francisco and I just happened to see somebody here. I was reading the newspaper and I was here earlier this year. I was doing some business and I saw that a group of nuns, a group of sisters from Notre Dame were getting kicked out. They're feeding the homeless and they're about to become homeless. In one of the richest communities in the world here, San Francisco, with a tech community. And I couldn't believe that no one was doing anything. So I went and met these sisters and said, let me negotiate with your landlord. I don't think he wants to be hated by all humans. <laughs> and I met Kevin Fagan over here from San Francisco Chronicle. And I asked him, how do I get these nuns? He introduced me to them and I sat down with them and I went and negotiated with this man. Everything's negotiable. And there was great leverage. Do you want to die? you want everybody to hate you? And so I worked it out. So my intention was work it out, give him $50,000 so he wouldn't raise the rent, keep him in, and then I promised them I'd get him out within the year and help them find a new place. But I got so inspired, the nuns started looking for a place. And I was going to help them lease it. But they started looking to buy a place. It's like, how are you going to buy a place? You have no money. They said, well, you're praying to God that someone will show up and buy it for us. And I'm thinking, shit. <laughs> So I bought them a place. They have their own place. So I thought, shit, I don't even live in San Francisco. What am I doing doing it here? But if you're resourceful, you do what's right wherever you are. And then we got them a place, and then the people were fighting us on the soup kitchen. And then so I needed a new place for them to be. So Mark's never acknowledged it, but I have to acknowledge it. I called my buddy. I said, Mark, I bought the soup kitchen. How about you buy my condominium? And Mark did. He bought the place that they all live. Have a hand for Mark Benioff over here. Pretty amazing here, right? So before we go any further, if you find real value by the time I'm done here, and I believe you will, significant value since you came here and paid something, I'm sure, I'd like to invite you to match me in helping either these local sisters or Feeding America. And I will match whatever you give, $10, $10,000, up to $5 million, I'll personally match. This room is filled with some players. If you're at that level, I'll do it. If you want to get resourceful and give in 10 bucks, or resourceful and give 10,000, or resourceful and give 5 million, I'll match you. Or if you just want to help these nuns out, I want to point it out. I bring this up really simply because whether it's becoming President of the United States, or feeding your family, or feeding the world, or changing your business, it comes down to resourcefulness. They asked Sam Walton in 1974, had 78 stores. And if you read the Wall Street Journal, and if you read a bunch of the reviews done by the financial community, they all said in that year, sell. Does anybody know why they said sell? Sell Walmart in 1974. 78 stores. Why were they going to sell them? Because they said he's out of what? The R word. What is it? What? Resources. He has no more resources. He has no more cash. He has no more capability. And plus, who else is going to want to buy this cheap shit except this crappy little parts of the South? No one's going to want this anywhere else. And at that time, who are the biggest retailers in the world, remember? Sears and Kmart. What happened to Kmart? <laughs> Bankrupt. Look at the slot number of stores. 1,300, 851. The combined market value of Sears and Kmart was 65 times Walmart. Where is Walmart today, ladies and gentlemen? How many stores throw out there? It's the dominant player on the face of the earth. Today, you got 11,000 stores and a half a trillion in sales. A thousand dollar investment back then, if you didn't listen to these people and you never put another dime in, it would be worth $25 million today. Because people underestimated his resourcefulness. Business is resourcefulness. Your career is resourcefulness. You want to move up? Get resourceful. And the only way you're going to do that, number one, it isn't enough to be intelligent. I know you're smart as hell. But sometimes being so smart puts an ego on us and makes us not maximize our resources. Who's with me on this? Raise your hand and say, I. 
And I'm here one to say, listen, if you lose your hunger, if you're willing to settle for less than you can be or do or create or share, then you're selling yourself short and you're going to make your life have not the juice it deserves. Who's with me here? Say I. I. So if we want to know what it takes to succeed, you already have it. Every one of you is resourceful. But if we want to take it to another level, what's the level we want to get resourceful at? Let's talk business first, then your personal life. Okay, is that fair? Are you still with me? Yes. Great. By the way, if you think about this, if you want to know what it takes to succeed in business, if you own your own business, how many are small business here where there's an owner in the room? Raise your hand if you're an owner of a business. Awesome. How many have kind of a medium-sized business here? How many are enterprise size? Let me see a shot of enterprise size businesses. How many have no idea what size your business is or you're too tired to raise your freaking hand? <laughs> Thank you very much. So whatever your business size or capacity is, if we want to know what it takes to grow a business, all you got to look is the most successful businesses or you could go back to Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker said it 30 years ago. He said all business is is two functions, innovation and marketing. Innovation and marketing employs everyone else. You can't have accounting without a company that isn't constantly innovating and marketing. So let's write down what those are, because it's also true in your career. If you want to move up within a company or grow your company, you've got to innovate and market. What is innovation? It means finding a way to do more for others than whom? Anyone else. If you become the dominant force to do more for others than anyone else, it's probably you begin to realize business is a spiritual game. Because what does every religion in the world talk about? Every great philosophy of meditation talk about? Treat thy neighbor like thy, love thy neighbor like thy, and yet how many people really do it? If you're innovating, you're looking for new ways to make life better. And the way to do that, if you want to jot down one thought that will change the game, that most in high intention quality business owners fail to do at small businesses and medium, and certainly at enterprise, is they forget. They start falling in love with their products and services. That is death in the world of constant change. You have to fall in love with your clients. This guy over here, and I'm, I'm blowing smoke, and it may sound like to you, but I love Mark, I love him dearly, I've known him all these years, and you must have great respect for him or you wouldn't be in this room. We've all benefited from what he's created, that vision made from decisions. But this man is nothing but innovation. It is, in my opinion, Forbes. How do you win most innovative company five years in a row for a half decade straight? You do it because he's not falling in love with his products. He's always willing to change the product. He doesn't give a damn the product. He cares about you. He's thinking constantly about how can I make life better for you. He just got traveling before he got here to eight different cities. He works around the clock. He's so excited he's going to do another eight cities right afterwards because he wants to know, what do you want? This entire company that dominates its industry is driven by that concept of innovation. You don't fall in love. And don't fall in love with your job. Fall in love with somebody you want to serve within that company, those clients. Because if you do that, you'll move up within the company as well. If there's no limit to what you can do if you add more what? Add more what? Come on guys, add more what? I know you're starting to drip down into that state. Nothing wrong with it, but let's get it in our bodies. Because I know you intellectually, but most of us know the truth intellectually, but we don't do it. People know what they do, they don't do what they know. Because you've got to get it where it's activated. So innovation, that's what innovation's about. But if you innovate like crazy, that's not enough. you still got to be an effective marketer. In fact, who's ever seen someone who has an inferior product or service to your own and they've had bigger revenue sales impact? Raise your hand. How many have seen this? How many have been annoyed by this? Say, I. And why? Because they either innovated more and you were wrong, they were a better product, but very often they were a better marketer. Does the best product or service always win? Yes or no? No. The best marketed product will work at first, but if it's going to be sustained, it has to be the best product and the best marketing. Companies like Apple, companies like Google, companies like the company you're in right now, Salesforce, these are the companies that do both innovation and marketing. And if you're an employee of someone and you're saying, what's my ticket to make my life the way I want it? It's innovation and marketing within you. It's finding out what can I do to add more value to this company? What can I do to add more value to our clients? What can I do to make that happen? And then, how do I make people know? How do I get people want to do business with me? Want me to move up in the organization? That's what it really comes down to. Now, here's a question. Marketing today. Is marketing today easier or harder? Give me your first gut reaction nice and loud. Which one? Say it again. Easier or harder? 
I'm hearing a lot harder. Raise your hand if you think it's harder. Raise your hand if you think it's easier. Okay, well, the room is about 60-40. It sounded worse than that because harder people talk harder. It's harder. <laughs> Both of you are right. It's easier and it's harder. It's easier because there's more ways to market and there's cheaper ways to market. There's social media. There's un these incredible opportunities. It's harder because there's so much more competition. It's hard to get people's attention today, isn't it? Right? Everyone is trying to get attention. Where is advertising today? Tell me, where is it? Everywhere. It's on, it's on bananas. It's on people's t-shirts. It's on their ass. It's, it, it's crazy. In fact, right now, a lot of retailers that deal with millennials are in deep trouble right now because they don't want to wear a label of somebody's brand anymore. It's a whole different culture. And you're seeing these companies that are going right now, massive drop in profits trying to figure out what the hell do we do? Why? Because they didn't innovate enough, they didn't market enough to find out what does this person really want and need. They fell in love with their product. They fell in love with their service. They didn't fall in love with their client and understand what do they want, what do they need, what do they fear. And by the way, that's true whether you're the business or whether you work in a business. That's number one job for all of us. That's what makes the economy go. Who's with me here? Say I. I. You know how many... 15 years ago, research showed that the average person, if they were exposed to advertising, would see an average of four exposures before they took action. That was the average. Some people do it the first time, some people do it nine times, but the average is four. Does any of you know what the average is today? Oh, they just put it up there. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was very helpful. <laughs> 16. So those that said harder, you're right. It's harder because it takes so much more, but that also is precluding that your message isn't very engaging. If it's engaging enough, you can get them in the first time. Now, how do you do that today? Well, if you're a small business, you go, how do I compete? We've seen all these companies disappear, right? There used to be these small bookstores, and then who came along? Barnes and Noble. And they thought they owned everything. And then who came along? Amazon. And guess what? That's the game. Who did you used to search with years ago before Google? What company? I can't even hear you. <laughs> right? Yahoo, right? But no one searches Yahoo now. Right? They got displaced. That displacement came from innovation and marketing. Raise your hand if you follow here. Say, I. So if you and I are going to break through it, if you're a small business, I'm sure you're freaked out about it. If you're a business business, you think, I'm just going to spend more money. Today, spending more money isn't enough. Today, people want something that's authentic and real. Who's with me on this? Say, I. And without that, you really can't even get their attention. The old ways don't work. How many of you don't even see banner ads anymore? They're like invisible to you when you're on the web. Raise your hand and say, I, if that's true. Do me a favor. Raise your hand if you literally don't see the banner ads. Raise your hand. I want you to look around the room and look at the percentage that don't even see it. So, lesson one, no banner ads. <laughs> what you have to do today is find a way to add more value even in your marketing where your marketing is providing value, where you're providing information, insights, where you become a trusted resource. This organization is a great marketing organization, and the way they market is they don't just send you a bunch of stuff and say, buy it. They put on conventions like this and say, let's bring the very best that exists, let's bring whoever we can, let's do whatever we can to make sure these customers' lives are better. And that's why you have an allegiance. The technology works, but it's more than that. Remember back in 1997 when a little company called Apple was not the most profitable company in the world, when they were on the verge of bankruptcy, and they seemed to have no resources, but they had one thing still. They had groups of people, I was one of them, that like, my whole companies, they all went to Microsoft, and I was like, I'm keeping my Apple, and my creative team is gonna have Apple. And we stuck, even though there was no software, it was terrible, but they created something different. Watch this, no disrespect, just you give me the real feeling. I'm gonna say a company name, you make a sound you associate to that company. Make the sound, don't hesitate, from the gut. Microsoft. Microsoft. Apple. Apple. That's the difference. There's billions and billions of dollar difference in those little emotional differences that you can hear in a voice. Think about the difference in what's there. So having the ability to create a raving fan client, not a satisfied customer. Satisfied customers go away, raving fans stay. And so the component that I want you to look at though is what will really create that? Now, big companies, 
will try and do still major advertising. In fact, I got a phone call a couple of years ago, right before the Super Bowl, and it was a group from Nike, and they said, we want to do a commercial, and we'd like you to star in this commercial. And I said, listen, I'm the wrong guy. I love your product. And I said, for years I did freaking infomercials. I didn't want to do infomercials. Just no way to get my message out. So then, I'm, you know, you're between spray-on hair and fake diamonds and stuff. And I said, I hated it, but it, it got me the President of the United States as a client. It got me Serena Williams as a client. It got me Hugh Jackman as a client. It got me Steve Wynn as a client because people got exposed to my actual products that they bought and it made a difference in their life. So I said, you know, I don't really want this, but I'm doing this and I sure as heck don't want to do a commercial. And I said, I love, you know, great, great shoes, great everything. They go, no, this is really special. They said, Kobe Bryant has created a new shoe. It's the most incredible shoe. And I'm thinking, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> right? What's the difference between Nike and Adidas? Marketing. Isn't it true? What is really the difference in those shoes? Nothing. You just have to learn to brand, just do it, or you learn to brand. I don't even know Adidas. That ought to show you why Nike's doing better, right, for some people, right? It's no difference. But they said, listen, hear us out. We're going to do a commercial. You're going to love this. Because the commercial is going to be where Kobe's going to pretend to be you. And then he's going to be coaching the most successful people in the world. And he said, you'll be one of them. You'll be sitting there. But you'll also, we're going to also have, you know, uh, we'll have Serena Williams there. And we're going to have Kanye West. And we're going to have Richard Branson. I said, Richard's one of my friends. I said, Serena's one of my friends and clients. I know Kanye. If I call them now, they're going to tell me they're going to be in the commercial. And they said, if you are, they will. <laughs> so I called Richard. We're supposed to have a meeting like two weeks there in London. I said, are you really going to come film this? He goes, if you are, I go, great. We have a meeting in LA. I'm in for it. <laughs> so we do this little commercial. <laughs> what the hell is that? And that made them sell a lot of shoes in their mind because all they understood is something that makes no sense. Did anybody see anything about shoes that made any sense in this? No, because the marketing was, can you imagine how much it cost to put all those people in a room and do this little endorsement? That was a huge sum of money. Those are some of the biggest players on earth. And they got the return because people don't buy products. They buy emotions. They buy identities. If you buy a Volkswagen, you're buying a different identity than if you're buying a Ferrari. And people buy Volkswagens think people buy Ferraris are absolutely stupid. And people buy Ferraris and think people buy Volkswagen go, what's wrong with them? Because we all identify things and branding is that identity. So today, though, you can do this with almost no money. You're a small business or even a big business. It's now it's about using your brain to brand differently. There's a, some of you remember the Chilean miners? Do you remember the Chilean miners that were stuck underground for, what, 70 days, whatever it was? How many remember the, that story? You should, because it was all over the world. And when they were about to get out, somebody really smart figured something out. We don't want to spend that kind of money. We can get a bigger impact than that right away if we're just a little bit creative, if we're a little resourceful, remember? And so a little company called Oakley said, what's going to happen when those people come out and they've been underground for two and a half months? They're going to be blinded by the light. So they flew one of their guys with 32 pairs of glasses, which cost them about $2,000, and that's probably whatever, not even $2,000. And they got a half a billion dollars of advertising. That picture was on every major newspaper, every TV pieces around the world. That's the difference to being resourceful as a marketer or just going and spend a ton of money and hoping you can still be part of that old order. How many follow? Say I. I. Now you might say, but Tony, we, our company, we sell data. We sell something else. We don't sell something emotional. People don't buy for emotion. You're wrong. They still buy an identity. Dollars. Right? Not bad. You know, Harry Potter, they're opening a brand new Harry Potter that they're going to do down at Universal Studios. And people have been waiting for years. And of course, Universal had a budget. I apologize. I don't remember the number, but it was a gigantic marketing budget. But fortunately, the person running marketing was much more resourceful. So you know what she did? She decided she was going to spend not $1 on advertising, not a penny. She wasn't going to make even a commercial to go on the web. She called the 12 largest bloggers in the world who are experts and followed on Harry Potter. She said at midnight, send them a special invitation. There's only 12 of you. You're, if you're late by one second, you're off the call. We're going to give you a special insight to what's coming. 
She spent an hour on the phone telling them the story of what was going to happen. And within 24 hours, more than 250 million people around the world knew everything about what that park was and didn't spend a penny because she was resourceful. Don't tell me you don't have the resources. If you don't, it's because you're low energy. It's because you're so freaking smart, you're in your own way. You're getting your brain being smart. You're staying in your head. I tell people, stay in your head, you're dead. It's the heart where you'll find the breakthrough. Who's with me on this? Say, I. And that's also true whether you're a company or whether you're an individual in the company wants to move up. Because I know some of you are like, well, that's great for the company. What about me? This is really about you in the end. How you can be more resourceful to innovate, bring more value. If you brought that to Universal, do you think that woman's going to move up in that company? <laughs> You think people in that company are going to want her to be a top executive? There is no limit. The only limit to our impact is our creativity and caring. If you care enough and you're creative enough, there is no limit. But most of us allow our mind to get in the way and we get caught up. Or we just do what we've been doing and we do it a little bit better. But that's not going to make you feel alive. It's not going to feel joy in your life. Now, here's a question. Is it possible that the breakthrough you're looking for, by the way, how many came here looking for breakthroughs for your business or within your career? Raise your hand if that's one of the main reasons you came here besides to party, because you kept me all out last night. I know you're out partying like crazy. How many came here for some breakthroughs? Raise your hand and say, aye. aye. Great. Breakthroughs are sometimes counterintuitive. Sometimes it's the littlest thing they'll do it. I want to get you to think about this in this business because you could make breakthroughs that no one thought of because they're looking for the big thing. If you're a tech person, if you're a salesperson, we all think a certain way based on the way we've been conditioned and trained. But if you think outside the nine dots, if you do what everybody else does, you do a little bit better, you have a little advantage. But if you do what no one else does, you have a gigantic advantage. So I'll give you an example. What did Steve Jobs do in 1997 when Apple was almost bankrupt and he had no real money? One thing is he made a deal with Microsoft, which was like the evil empire to Apple. But what did he do? What, was, what did he do to come up with a product? He didn't have time? He came up with a product that most people would say, well, there's no innovation. In fact, his engineers, the people inside, they're all saying, this is a piece of crap you want to build. He said, trust me, we're going to do this. I don't think he said, trust me, he was a little more intense than that. Right? He said, this is what we're going to do. Don't question me, I think is what he actually said. You probably know what he said. You were good buddies back then. And so what happened? He, I know what had happened because one of my dear friends said to me one day, we're talking about computers for some reason, I don't know why, but he says, my grandmother wants a computer for the first time. And I said, what kind? He said, that's what I asked her. And she said, a pink one. You remember what happened with the old iMac? Do you guys remember that breakthrough? That's what kept the company alive. And all it was, was what color were computers before that? What color were they? Throw up beige, weren't they? Right? And all of a sudden, all he did was come out and bring color. That was massive innovation. Now, how much creativity, how much money did that shit cost? That's what we're talking about when I talk about being innovative. You want to think outside of it. I'll ask you a question. Where were you in 1999? Where were you living? What were you doing for a living? Were you partying like it was 1999? <laughs> Who remembers where you were in 1999? Okay, now that you're there, stay there for a moment. 1999, answer this question for me. If in 1999, what was the dominant computer company in the world? Who was it? Quick. Microsoft controlled, what, 98% of all computers through their software. 98%, that's a fairly large market share. Right? Now, at that time, Bill Gates had a really beautiful vision, brilliant vision. He wanted to get rid of all those Britannic encyclopedias, and he wanted to create this online resource that would allow you to be able to know all the knowledge of humanity for everyone, anytime. And he had a budget that was virtually unlimited, and some of the smartest people literally in the world that worked at Microsoft. Is it true, yes or no? Smartest people, unlimited money. That's called unlimited resources. Now, his competition was a group of people working as volunteers. All volunteers, no money, no background, no experience, no infrastructure, and supposedly not as smart, because they certainly weren't paid that kind of money to be smart. If I asked you in 1999, who would you bet on? Be honest, if you had to put a sum, a large sum of money, Microsoft with all the resources, or a little group of volunteers called Wikipedia, who would you have bet on? Tell the truth, nice and loud, go. 
That's right. And you would have lost heavily. And the reason I tell you that is really simple. When we talk about innovation, when we talk about breakthroughs, sometimes the littlest thing is the biggest thing. The littlest thing. By the way, being first is not enough any, anymore either. You can be first and then Apple comes along and takes it from you afterwards. Right? Being first is not it. There was a company called Vimeo that was first in the marketplace doing what now most of you think YouTube does. In fact, if you looked at it back then, we saw Vimeo and you saw YouTube, two year difference between them. I know Chad who created YouTube, brilliant guy, and what he did was really good, what I teach, he modeled them. He saw what they did and he modeled them. If you looked at them visually back then, they looked very, very similar. They did the exact same thing. But one was sold for $1.65 billion a couple of years later. And the big, big difference, what was the difference? Look at them. Visually look pretty much the same. Someone tell me, what was the $1.65 billion difference? No, they uploaded the same way. Speed, they had the same speed. In fact, Vimeo was a little bit faster. They had a little bit more efficiency in the beginning. Somebody just said it. You must know the story, sir. There were, look it up, put it up on the screen there. There was one share button versus nine share buttons on YouTube. Somebody said, the more you ask, ask and you shall what? Receive. If we ask enough times, they'll share. But when people share, you get that geometric multiplied effect that we all understand now. That difference is the difference between two large companies, one of which is kind of nice but is dwarfed by YouTube and the other which went on to become the basis of where most people put their time and their energy for a lot of people for creation. So I want you to get that if you and I are going to go to a different level, all you got to understand is it isn't beyond your reach. It's beyond your reach if you're low energy, it's beyond your reach if you're unresourceful, it's beyond your reach if your ego tells you you're so smart. We need to put our smarts aside and use them with enough emotion and connection to say, how can I add more value? That's where the game really changes. Who's with me on this? Say, I. I. Now, so that comes down to then, how do we really make sure that we succeed? Then how do we get this resourcefulness in our companies? How do we do it within ourselves? Let's start with the companies. The most challenging thing in the world today is a term. You know, in business, we always have these terms. They come buzzwords. We hear them so much. But the reason they start out is because they're usually true. And that buzzword is engagement, right? I know Mark is obsessed with engagement. I'm obsessed with engagement. When I walked up here, I'm running up here, they wanted me to run from back there, it's hot as hell, and I'm looking around and nobody's engaged. What the hell? And so I know I can't serve you if we don't become engaged together. I'll, I can't do that if I just hear and talk to you or talk at you. So that's why I asked you and I really thank you for participating and I want to keep that energy going because we've gone long enough that you've begun to go back into your learning trance. And you're being very kind and participating, I'm really grateful for it. But the higher the energy, the more you retain. Who's with me here? Say, I. Let's talk about engagement. What the hell's engagement? Engagement is where everything grows. What's our job in business? Our job is to add more what? Win. Once in a while or every time? If you do it for decades, you become a brand. If you become a brand, people bend down on one knee, reach behind other things to buy Coca-Cola. Even though very often when you do studies, and they've done in the past, some of their competing brands seem to have a better taste test result. People don't give a shit, give me the Coke. Because <laughs> it gives them certainty. Because it becomes part of their identity, right? So our job is to engage people. And if we look at engagement, involvement, passion, connection, massive focus on how to do more for the client than anybody else, what, how are we doing that? How are we doing? Well, most of us pat ourselves on the back, but throw up the statistics. This is scary and crazy, and it shows you why economies around the world are where they are right now. According to the Gallup poll, which was done in 142 countries, intensive, 13% of employees worldwide are truly engaged at work, meaning they're passionately connected to the sense of mission, the value, and when they're at work, they're trying to maximize their time for the benefit of that mission. That means, by the way, 87% are not engaged. Now, it's better in the United States. We're better than anywhere else in the world. We have the highest engagement, a whole 29%. Think about that. That means 71% of US workers are disengaged. That's pretty crazy. Does that make you crazy? And I know it's true. I know I went and did 
when I went on this last book tour, I did 110 interviews. It's crazy, most I'd ever done. And so I was going all around, and I won't mention the companies, but I was going to all the media companies, and I walked into these buildings. I got 31 companies. I, I have very passionate values about how we play the game of life, right? And I walked into these buildings, and the world, because we're so technology-driven, it's so dead, but I'm walking around watching people on their personal Facebook, tweeting, doing all this stuff, and the energy is so low because there's no mission. And you look around and go, how do these companies survive? And if you look at our economy, our productivity has dropped. Everything else dropped because now we're so distracted because we have so few companies that have that mission connection today. And the ones that do, they dominate, completely dominate in that process. Now, what should really concern you is the next statistic. 24% are actively disengaged. What does that mean? It means they have no passion for their work, they lack any motivation to get the job done, they're unhappy, and they're likely to attack the company. If you're trying to grow your business and one quarter of them are trying to screw you over that work for you, that are your partners, how many know people like this in your own business? Come on, raise your hand if you know them. Nice and high, raise your hand if you look around the room. Clearly Donald Trump has at least one of those that sent his taxes to the New York Times. Right? Somebody was actively disengaged at the Trump Organization, sent his tax returns, and kind of gave him a whole other challenge for him to deal with once again, because he didn't have enough before this. That's how bad it is. Now here's what's great. The companies that do have engagement have an unbelievable competitive advantage. You name, what are some of the companies that have the most engaged employees? Instead of me telling you, you tell me, tell me. And they're already putting it out there, thank you so much. Your timing is wonderful. We put Salesforce, do they have you engaged, yes or no? Yes. What other company gets a convention of 100,000 people to come and spend time for days, throws the best parties with YouTube, gives you the best technology, and you want to come back? How many have come back here more than once to this Dreamforce? Let me see your show hands. That's called engagement. But the employees at Salesforce engage. Because Mark started out with a vision from the very beginning. We're both into contribution. In the very beginning, he said, tell him we'll do this one, one, one plan that now Google uses, right? 1% of our stock, 1% of our profits, 1% of our time. I'm sure he'll go over the newest statistics in his, well, his talk tomorrow, so I won't say a word and steal that from his company, his ideas, but I'm impressed, and I'm sure you will be too. Google, Starbucks, Zappos, you name it. Tony Robbins, somebody, but that's not, that's not, a, that's, oh, that's the slide of Tony Robbins. Okay, I'll get that. <laughs> They're trying to put us with Salesforce. We're not in that, that realm. Not yet, anyway. So the point is, what these companies have is an advantage. Here are the statistics that the study showed. Throw them up there real quick for us, if you would. Now, the things you see immediately when you look at these companies are 20% higher profitability on average, 10% higher customer ratings, 28% less theft, 48% fewer safety incidents. I'll tell you what else they found. Nearly two times greater satisfaction at work, 1.7 to be exact and they're three times more likely to stay. How important is that to a company's sustainability? Right, today, the average cost, if you lose a sales executive, it costs you a million dollars in business, and it'll take 12 months before you were back to the same level to replace that person. All because you didn't fully engage. So how do we get people to engage? We get them to engage, because think about this, how can you get us to engage if you're not fully engaged? And how many of us have been guilty of getting overwhelmed, stressed, frustrated, whatever, and not being fully engaged. Who's been there before? Even in this room of engaged people, raise your hand and say, I. So if we, the hungry, driven ones, can let this happen to ourselves, you can know what's happening with everybody else that's not as driven as you are in this area. So it is a challenge, to say the least. How do we solve that challenge? Well, you can't move someone if you're not moved. You can't touch someone if you're not touched. And that's why what we're here to do today, I want to talk about in a few moments, may be the most important thing of all. And that is making sure that you are fully engaged in a way that produces the maximum results that you want. So rather than me tell you, if I tell you to be me telling you, here's what I want you to do. Stand up just for a second real fast. Stand up, shake your body out, shake it out just for a second, shake it out, shake it out, and put yourself in a group of three people as fast as you can. If you've got a notebook with you, you're welcome to do it, but go grab three people real fast. And one of you grab a notebook, or a phone, or an iPad, or something. And what i like to do, all three of you raise your right index finger towards the ceiling in your group, all three of you. 
Okay, point to the leader of your group now. <laughs> Whoever's got the most fingers, you're it. If you all pointed at yourselves, we know a little bit about your group. <laughs> okay? So here's what, leader, here's what you do. I want you, in fact, just sit down first for just a moment. Now you know who your group is. In a moment, you're going to jump back up with your group. I want you to write down the answer to a question. Throw up on the screen for me the questions real quick. I want you to write down an honest answer as to how engaged are you to your maximum capability? How would you rate your level of engagement with the people you lead and manage on a scale from 1 to 10? 10 is absolutely off the charts, mind-boggling, they blow your mind. One is that I got a dead group of people, right? And what do you need to improve? What do you need to improve to increase that engagement? Instead of me telling you, you tell me. You tell each other. And the third question is, what specifically do you need to do to engage your people at a different level? What could you do? Because we're going to share this because then you'll get some ideas from the other two people as well. And finally, what do you do, what, what do, you do a less than adequate job engaging what could you do better with that person? In other words, think of someone you're not good at engaging. If you're good at engaging everybody, how many have a problem child? Someone who does not maximize their resources within your team. Raise your hand if you got somebody like that. Good. Then I want you to write down that person and ask yourself, instead of they're screwed up, what could I do? Where, where am I not engaging? How could I engage them more? So five quick questions, and then I'm going to put you with your team. Body out, shake it out, wake it up. Give me your score. How many of you were a perfect 10 in your engagement as a leader? Raise your hand. Okay. One liar. Good. Very nice. How many were a 9? Raise your hand if you gave yourself a 9. Who was an 8? Okay, now I want you to look. 90% of this room, maybe 95, is below an 8 on a 0 to 10 scale. By your judgment, not mine. I'm not so judgmental of you as you are. And if you're below an eight, how could you possibly maximize your resources? Much less enjoy yourself because, listen, when you don't give your all, I remember I, I, I got a chance to interview Coach John Wooden. Anybody remember who John Wooden is? <laughs> Greatest basketball coach in history of the world, college basketball. Won 11 national championships, 88 games in a row. And it wasn't like the Bulls with Michael Jordan. Every year was new players. It's college. I remember he taught me something. He said, Tony, I asked him which one was his team that he was most proud of. And I know a little bit about basketball. I'm old enough to remember Lou Alcindor, Jabbar, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, people like that. I thought that was going to be the group for sure. The winning is team. That was not the team he picked. He picked the team I'd never heard of. And I said, why that team? They didn't perform as high as these other teams. Why would you pick them as the greatest team you ever worked with? He said, Tony, because they maximized their abilities. He said, you know what? He taught, anyone ever worked or was coached by Coach Wooden, he taught people really something simple. He taught them how to be great men. And the way he did it was he said, it's really simple. Stop thinking about the score of the game and focus on one thing you can control. How much you give every moment you're on that court. He said, there are going to be days when you win and when you lose. But the only days you're going to know when you win or lose are going to be by your measurement of yourself. If you, every single moment you're on that court, you're engaged at level 10 or above, if such a thing were to exist, and you gave every ounce of yourself every minute on the court, then it doesn't matter what the score is you won. Because you became more. And you gave more. And in life, we don't get to keep anything except what we give. Because that's what makes us become something different. His entire mindset, by the way, was if you give your all every single moment on the court, and every one of us does, if all of us are 100% engaged, he said, 99% of the time, you're going to the highest score. Sometimes someone's going to get lucky. They'll get a different call. The ball will drop. But you can't control that. You can control you. So if you're below an eight, which most of this room is, it might be time to change. And maybe that's what I felt when I walked in this room and the energy was lower. It's like, it's not a judgment. It's just, I want you to have the enjoyment that comes at 10. How many can remember a time where you were so engaged in something that bombs could be going off? You would know you were like right there in the zone. Nothing else could distract you. Who's ever been in that place? Say, ah. Make a sound of how it feels when you're in that state. Make a sound. Go for it. Now, make the sound of level seven engagement. And then imagine doing that every day. So then you want to find some new technology that will get you excited again. And the technology is only as good as our engagement. 
Who's with me on this? Say I. I. So now I want to ask you real fast, round robin, while you're standing with your group. What makes someone engaging? What makes someone disengaging? Make a list, you have one minute, go. Together, do it together, don't sit down, do it together. Somebody tell me, give me an example of two things that make them engaging, two or three make them engaging, two or three make them disengaging. Anyone, raise your hand, let me grab somebody, we'll grab a microphone. How about, yes sir, right here, give him a hand. Uh, name's Poncho, I'm from San Luis Obispo. Great, tell us three things that make somebody, make you want to engage with them, tell us three things that make you want to disengage or not be involved with them. Yeah, so engagement, uh, positivity, uh, level-headed, mission-oriented. Okay. Uh, disengaging, unappreciative, grumpy, and unjust. Very nice. Give them a hand. Very nice. Something like that. Tell us three things that make people engaging. Tell us three things that make you not want to engage in them or disengage. Uh, empathy, drive, and positivity. Okay. Disengage would be lazy, mean, and somebody that has the worst case scenario attitude. Very nice. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. Tell us. And we came up with one person. Three things for someone to be engaging would be drive, positivity, and openness. Great. Um, disengaging would be victim, low energy, and a me, not we attitude. Give her a hand. Thank you very much. Let's see what you do inside yourself to turn on engagement or turn it off. Now, human emotion is energy in motion. That means if you want to change how you feel, you can do it by how you move. If you try to do it with your head, you can go in circles, can't you? Rationalize, go in the nut. So I want you to try something real fast. We're going to do a real simple exercise. I want you to discover how you can change your own engagement and your own interaction with people by seeing what you do in your body when you go to engage someone. And I'm going to give you some deliberate scenarios. We're going to do three real fast. Number one, when I say now, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to as many people as possible as you can in two minutes. When you do that, I want you to introduce yourself to people you don't know, but I want you to do it from a different emotional state. I want you to do it as if you think this is the stupidest exercise in the world and it's a waste of your time. And why do you have to talk to this idiotic person? In other words, you're not going to say it, but I want you to walk up to them like it's a total waste of your time. Hi, how you doing? You're going to shake their hand like, 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 you know, you, sir, come here. You, come here. Come here. What's your name? What? A Adrian? Adrian! <laughs> Deliberately walk up and be in a state where you really think it's a waste of your time. I don't have to talk to this person, but you're going to do it anyway. And I want you to notice, listen, notice what you do to be in that state in your body. What do you do with your face? What do you do with your breathing? What do you do with your posture? Do you go straight towards them or do you hesitate? I want you to notice not only how it feels to be greeted that way, that'll be obvious. I want you to notice what you got to do to be in a state where you disengage with someone like, like it's a waste of your time. Get to as many people as you can in a minute and a half and notice what you do. By the way, you're going to be in a state where you don't want to do this, you're just doing it because you have to. Go. Okay, stop wherever you are in the room. Freeze. Freeze where you are in the room. Now, it wasn't hard for some of you to freeze because you didn't go anywhere. went, hi, hi, I'm done. <laughs> Now, how many of you couldn't help yourself? You're like, hi, hi, hi. I saw a few of you out there. How many actually did it? How many actually did it? Raise your hand if you really did it. Say hi. So I want you to yell out the answer because we have about, what, 7,000 people in this room and they're from all over the world. So it's a great test ground for human beings. Raise your hand if you had to change your body to go in this lousy state. In some way, raise your hand if you had to change your body. Say hi. Raise your hand and say I if you change the muscles in your face to get in this little annoyed state. Say I. I. Uh, tell me, did you, did you increase your breathing more full or more shallow in this state? Shallow. Nice and loud. Which one? Shallow. Which one? Shallow. Did you talk louder or quieter? Quieter. Which one? Quieter. Which one? Quieter. Did you talk faster or slower in this state? Slower. Which one? Slower. Kind of like the room when I walked in here. And I want you to get this. There are 7,000 people here from, what, 100 plus countries? And you're all saying the exact same thing. And I didn't tell you those things you're telling me because in order to go in that crappy state, that's what you all have to do. If you use your body that way, you're going to feel lousy no matter who you're around. And many of us don't. We think it's other people, and it's the state we put ourselves in. So there's a pattern here that's pretty universal, isn't there? So let's try something. Shake that out of your body. Get out of that state. And let's try a totally different state this time. 
this time I want you to do this like you're a little kid. If you do it like an adult, you're like, why are we doing this stupid exercise? But if you're a kid, you have fun with stuff. Who's going to have some fun with this? Say, ah. Awesome. And here's what I want you to do. In a moment, I want you to introduce yourself to as many people, different people again. But this time, I want you to do it from a state where you're deathly afraid they're going to reject you. Okay? Now, don't tell me you know. Who's ever not done something because you're afraid of being rejected or failing? Raise your hand. Say, ah. So wouldn't it be useful to know what you do to put yourself in that place? Because if we know what it is, we could what? Change it, because it's in your body. It's not just in your head. And when you know the pattern, you can change it. So I want you, when you do this, to exaggerate your fear. Do you know why? Because achievers never get fearful. We just get stressed. <laughs> and stress is the achiever word for fear, isn't it? If I follow the trail of stress, it'll bring me to your deepest fear. And the fear we all have is, I might fail, and then it means I'm not enough. And if I'm not enough, I won't be loved. Those are the deepest fears that people have inside their head. I want you to do this. I want you to imagine, really, like a little kid shows their fears. Adults like, I'm not afraid. <laughs> like this tension in their face, right, their body. I want you to just really go for it. It's kind of like, you know, like if I came up and said, hi, what's your name? Hey, Bob, how you, how you doing? <laughs> Give her a hand. It's evolved, ladies and gentlemen. Give her a hand. It's kind of like, how many of you in this room have ever watched, like, let's say the Olympics, the Winter Olympics on television? And you're sitting in your chair and you're watching someone skiing or snowboarding as you're sitting to yourself and you're something this. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say hi. I want you to exaggerate so you see what you're doing on a more subtle level. Just one minute, as many people as you can. But like a little kid, you're deathly afraid. And I want you to see, what do you do different with your face, your shoulders, your breath, your voice, the way you shake hands? And let's see if it's different or the same as when you're really annoyed. I think you're going to find it's quite different. Ready? Go. Take your body out. Get out of that state. Question. Did you use your body the same or different than when you're pissed off and annoyed? Which one? Yes. Raise your hand if you change the muscles in your face in a very different way than when you're annoyed. Raise your hand and say, I. Did you talk louder or quieter than when you're pissed off? Faster or slower? Yes. Did you go straight for him or hesitate? Did you breathe more full or even more shallow than when you're annoyed? Which one? Can you hear everyone saying the same thing? What are the chances of 7,000 people from 100 countries without direction saying they're feeling the exact same thing in their body when they're feeling the emotion. It's because we're all unique, but when you use your body one way, you're going to be pissed off. You use another way, you're going to be feeling fearful. And if, how fast can we change how we feel then if all we got to is change our movement? How fast? Like that. Let's take one more. Shake your body out. Okay? This time, how many of you own your own business? Let me see your hands. How many of you are leaders of the business? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are parents? Raise your hand. How many of you have a relationship, check this out, a relationship with a human, with a human? <laughs> then this shit's gonna work for you. Here's what I want you to do. When I say now, I want you to greet people, but we're gonna change the motivation because I hate the word motivation. I've never been a motivator, but I do believe motive does matter. If your motive is just to manipulate, most of us have pretty giant bullshit meters and we can figure that out at this stage, can't we? I mean, even reality television is bullshit. So we know what's true. How many know what I'm talking about here? Say, I. I. So the motive change is going to be this. I want you to approach somebody and greet people and meet people in two minutes, but we're going to have a different understanding. If this person does not like you in the first three to five seconds of meeting you, they don't like you in the first three to five seconds of meeting you. They are not going to do business with you and your children are not going to eat next week. <laughs> or just in case you don't have kids, we'll do it this way. If they don't like you in the first three to five seconds, then everyone you care about dies like pigs in hell. <laughs> if it was that important, I bet you use your body and face differently, wouldn't you? So, by the way, when you go to do this, I'm talking full tilt like it really is true. And let's see if you use your face, your voice, and your body differently. Ready? Go! If that felt better, say I! I. Say I. I! Question, did you use more of your body or less of your body? 
More muscles in your face or less? More. More voice, louder voice or quieter? More. Faster or slower than the other two we did? Faster. Did you hesitate or go straight for them? Straight. Did you touch them? Yes. Did it feel good? Yes. Why? You should have seen who I touched. <laughs> no. Because emotion is created by motion. In other words, listen to me. If you use more of the gifts your creator has given you, you will experience the gifts you think you're looking for somewhere. Everything you want, everything you want to feel is already inside you, my friends. Was that the... How many feel very different right now than we began? Raise your hand if you feel much better than we began. Raise your hand. Say ah! Say ah! Question, that last greeting you just gave. By the way, do people ever judge... People would never judge someone in real life in the first three to five seconds of meeting them, would they? Was that the best greeting you're capable of giving a stranger? Yes or no? Yes or no? Was that the best greeting you're capable of giving a stranger? Yes or no? Quick. How many say yes? How many say no? Okay, the majority are saying no. Now, if you're saying no, let's review the assignment, shall we? We said if you don't give your best, then everyone you care about dies like pigs in hell and you still didn't give your best? We need to talk. You know what? If you said you didn't give your best, I actually respect you. Because what we all know in our souls is, whenever we think we've given our best, what do we always find out? There's always another what? Is it true? So let's go there one final time. You go, what are we going to do? Get naked? No, no, no. Here's what you're going to do. This time I want you to greet somebody like they're your long lost lover or best friend. Like, oh my God, it's Susie. Move. There she is. Oh my God, I see her. There she is. Oh, wow. How are you? Wow. So good to see you. So good to see you. I want you to greet people like your long lost best friend or lover. One, two, three, go. Point is, it's resources. And if you're resourceful enough, you can do it. So when I was writing this book, I decided to get a little resourceful myself, and I thought, gosh, I, have, I grew up dirt poor, no money for food. And somebody fed my family when I was 11 years old. And they came to the door literally on Thanksgiving, and knocked on the door, and here is this tall guy standing there with bags of food in a, in a pan on the floor on the ground with an uncooked turkey. And I'll never forget, he said, is your father home? And I said, just one moment. And I ran to get my dad, thinking he'd be so excited. And unfortunately, he was not. He was annoyed, even though we didn't have any food. And the man said, sir, this is a gift from you. If someone knows you're having a tough time, they want you to have a beautiful Thanksgiving. And my father said, we don't take charity. And he went to slam the door in the man's face. And the man kind of had his foot here, and it bounced off his foot. And he's holding the bag still. And he said, sir, he said, this is not a handout. Everyone has tough times. This is a gift. The person's doing it anonymously. They just want you to have a great Thanksgiving. And my dad said, we don't take charity. He started to slam the door again. This time he put his shoulder into it and he hit and bounced off of him. He, and then he said something to my father. I thought my father was going to punch him. He said to my father, don't let your family, he points straight at me, don't let them suffer because of your ego. Oh, I thought there was going to be a fight. My dad gave him a scowl, took the groceries, threw them on the table, slammed the door, never said thank you. And that day impacted me. It's why I'm here right now. Because that day, I had to figure out a question in my mind, which is, how could my father be so angry about someone helping? And how come I was so happy? And the reason is, right now, as you're listening to me, in every moment of your life, you're making three decisions. You might want to jot them down and see if it's true, right now. The first decision you're making is, what are you going to focus on? Because whatever we focus on, we feel. And most of us let the world control our focus. You know, people say we're in the information age. We're not in the information age. The information age died a long time ago. We're drowning in information. We're starving for wisdom, aren't we? And so the bottom line is, you look around and I see my father, and what did he focus on? He focused on the fact that he had not provided food for his family. How would that make you feel if you knew you had failed at that level? You can get he was beating himself up. I focused on the fact there was food. What a concept. I was so excited. He focused on he had not provided it. The second question we ask every moment of our life is, what does this mean? Is this the end or the beginning? Is this person dissing you? 
Is this person attacking you? Is this person challenging you? Is this person loving you? Is this person coaching you? Whichever meaning you make is going to determine your emotion. Am I here to pump you up and motivate you? Am I here to serve you? Am I here to offer you some pieces you can make some decisions from that could be life-changing if you want them to? You get to decide. But whatever you decide is going to be your experience today and every day of your life. And most of us don't make these decisions consciously. We've got a conditioned response based on our past. So for most of us, the future is pretty much going to be like our past. We might make more money. We might do better in business. But we run into the same problems over and over again. How many can relate in some way inside here? Raise your hand if you can. Say, I. My dad said the question, what does this mean? I know what it meant to him because he said it out loud over and over again to all of us. I knew he focused didn't have the food, but he didn't provide it because he said, I failed my family, I am a failure. There's no food for my family, there couldn't be a bigger failure. And the bottom line is, out of that experience, he made the third decision, what I want to do, and what he decided to do was leave our family shortly thereafter, which at the time was the most painful experience I thought of my life. But it turned out, you know, your worst experience of life can become your best if you decide to use it. And for me, I said, my God, there's food. But the big thing that changed my life was the meaning. And the meaning was strangers care. That's the meaning I pulled out of it. My father always said, no one gives a damn about anybody else. And I had plenty of evidence in the way we lived our life and the people around us. You know, there wasn't anybody coming to help before that ever. And we were always in a challenged place. When I started believing strangers care, it changed my whole life. One belief can change your life. Today, you can make one decision in the next little time we're together and literally change your life without hyperbole, without BS, without exaggeration, not positive thinking, because our beliefs create and our beliefs destroy our life. And we have to become conscious as which ones are empowering us, we use them more, which ones are pulling. And most of us are going so fast, responding to our world, that we don't actually stop and really check in and feel what's really going on. So my third one is, what am I going to do? I decided someday I'm going to give back. I'm going to do this for other people because this changed my life. And so I have. I started when I was 17. I decided to feed two families. And it was, I didn't have any money, but I was like committed. I went to the grocery store and I got two baskets. And I thought, I'm going to feed two families for like three days. I'm going to make this incredible Thanksgiving for them. I know what it meant to me. It's going to mean that to them. And I went to the store manager since I had much money and I said, here's what I'm doing, I'm gonna feed two families, help me out, give me a discount. And they gave me 10% off and I thought, cheap bastard. <laughs> but I took the 10%. <laughs> and it was the best shopping spree I'd ever gone on in my life. And I'll never forget, I called a local church I was connected to and I said, who do you know that needs help but won't ask for it? Because that was us. And they gave me the names of two families. And I'll never forget, I went to the first family and it, it's, it shaped everything in my life. Because I borrowed an old van from a friend of mine. A little, I didn't know how to drive a stick shift, so that was a very interesting drive. And I went took the groceries, and I pulled up to the first house, and I wrote a note, and I'd done it before I got there, and I said, this is just a gift from a friend. Have a beautiful Thanksgiving, and just know that you're deeply loved. Everyone has tough times. And if you can, someday do well enough to do this for one other family and pay it forward. I put love a friend. I didn't see who I was. And they had someone else write it in Spanish in the back just in case they didn't speak English, which was really helpful because when I got there, they didn't speak English. And this woman about this tall <laughs> opens the door and she sees me holding these two things. I wore t-shirts and jeans because I wasn't going to be the giver because I remember that insulted my dad. So I just made sure that it was just like, I'm the delivery boy. And this woman screamed and she grabbed my neck and she pulled me down and started kissing the side of my face. And I was like, no, no, delivery man, delivery man. She goes, no, 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 no. And she, I couldn't understand. And then she finally says, gift, gift God, gift God. Gift from God. And so I started getting a little teared. I was like, no, delivery guy. And, and so I kind of motioned where I put these groceries and I'll never forget. She motioned me in and as she did, she had four children and one hit one leg, one hit the other. <laughs> They were starving for love and attention, and they were really starving for food, too. And when they saw this, they were so excited, and it just lifted my soul. And so much so, that then they followed me back out to get to the truck, so they had, I got some more bags. When they saw the pumpkin pie, it was over. <laughs> and the moment that has seared into my memory of my life, that changed my life, was seeing at the end, I, I didn't want to leave, but I had to, I go to the other food, and then one little boy just would not let go of my leg, looking up to me, and. It was just one of those surreal moments in your life. 
because I was that boy one day, not that long ago. And so I walked in there and I tried to give him a hug and finally tried to excuse myself. I don't speak any Spanish. I felt embarrassed. I should have. But uh, I turned to the woman and she's crying like this and smiling and crying. Quite a mixture of emotion. I'm feeling myself trying not to cry. And then, you know, all of a sudden I kind of say, Happy Thanksgiving. And I know, so I said, Feliz Navidad. <laughs> I knew those two words, right? And I got in the van, I'll never forget. I put the thing in reverse, backed up, I looked up in the rearview mirror, and I saw her face with the four kids there. And oh, I left out one little detail that I found out. Her husband had left her a week before with kids with no money and no food. I had no clue. You want to talk about guidance, God, fate, whatever you want to call it. But it was there. Grace is what I would call it. And I remember I just started bawling uncontrollably. And I thought, why am I crying? It's such a beautiful moment. And I realized in that moment, the worst day of my life was the best day of my life. Because what I have ever been there if my father had been the man I wanted him to be in my life. If he had stayed, if he had done the things that I would want him to do, I wouldn't have the drive. And so I fed two families that time, that Thanksgiving. And then I went from there to four and then to eight. And then I got a little small company I started and they all got involved. And then I got to 100,000 people. And then I got to a million, then two million in about, I don't know, about 12 years ago. I fed two million people through my foundation and then I matched it. I've been matching every year since then. Four million people a year to be fed, to give you an idea. And then, when I read this, when I was writing this book, I got really resourceful. I thought, these guys are multi-billionaires. I'm moving in that direction, which is an incredible privilege. And I'm doing this good work, but i got to step up my game. Because while we're watching these guys make billions, we're also in a world where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer.